get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This episode is co-produced with DoThisNext.co, where you get simple, quick wins that will immediately create big results in your life and business. This is part of the Accelerated Learning Series where top entrepreneurs share how to create big changes. And today we have one of the top people in Accelerated Learning, Josh Josh Kaufman. He's a best-selling author of The Personal MBA and The First 20 Hours, How to Learn Anything Fast with an exclamation point. Josh publishes top quality research on business, productivity, and accelerated learning. His website, joshkaufman.net, was named one of the top 100 websites for entrepreneurs by the staff of Forbes, and his materials and videos have been watched and downloaded collectively tens of millions of times, and his TED Talk passed 3 million views. Congratulations on that, Josh. Thanks, Jeremy. Great to be here. Thanks for joining me, and you are a damn fine ukulele player, too. Thanks. Which we'll Thanks. talk about. I, I worked really hard on that. <laughs> 20 hours at least. <laughs> 20 hours. <laughs> so to start off, I know you have personally, uh, actually, before I go start in that, I like to include a fun fact. And fun fact about you is you have actually programmed your websites, all your websites from the ground up. Yeah, that was actually one of the things that I learned in the process of researching and writing first the first 20 hours was how to program. So I use that to build all of the programs and infrastructure that that run my websites. Wow. So what was the toughest part for you about learning to program? You know, it was actually figuring out how to get the program from my computer onto a machine that was accessible to the internet. It's it's reasonably straightforward to pull something up and kind of write your own program that will run on your machine. But the the infrastructure and how to connect things and and the plumbing aspect of that I had never done before so that was challenging any part of the learning process that you found to be more difficult with learning to code and software as opposed oh, the, to something else the research phase by far because there are so many resources um and unless you know exactly what you want to do at the beginning yeah. you can uh receive all sorts of conflicting information and advice. You're not quite sure where to start. And so figuring out what I wanted to build, what were the best tools to do that, and then what were the resources that were going to help me get this program onto the net. um, I had probably five times the research uh, time in programming before I could get started versus, you know, some of the other skills like ukulele, you pick up the ukulele, you tune it and, and you're into the practicing. Right. So, uh, yeah, it took a while to, to sift through what was important and what was not. Yeah. That's one thing I love about what you do is because you do tons of research ahead of time. How would you know, like when you're starting, what research to accept, what not to accept? Cause I'm sure they're reputable people on both ends. Sure. Uh, the best technique that I've found is don't just pick up one resource and try to work through it from beginning to end. So like programming, you can pick up a how to program in Ruby in 24 hours kind of tutorial. Okay. Um, I, have, I haven't found that very effective, uh, mostly because those things very rarely teach you what it is you want to learn the skill for. It's, it's a bunch of you know, canned exercise sorts of things. The best technique that I found is actually to research more than one or pick up more than one resource so go to amazon and pick up three to five different resources um on the same topic and then instead of spending hours and hours and hours going through one you spend an hour or two with each yeah and the what that allows you to do is there are going to be techniques and and strategies that are effective that will be mentioned in all of those resources yeah And that's a really good indication that those are the things that you should focus on learning first because they really are fundamental. Yeah, yeah. And from a selfish perspective, because I know you do a ton of research, what would you say in your research process is you have found that's unique to how you do things that maybe most people don't do? 
Oh, I go really, really broad. And and when I find something useful on the net, I save it. And so actually on on my website, joshkaufman.net, I have a um, a post on how to use Evernote to keep a research database. Mm-hmm, okay. And I was I was just uh, going through it the other day. I have over 10,000 very detailed articles wow. saved on all of the topics that I'm interested in. Wow. And so when I'm looking for a good resource that maybe I, I saw two years ago, I can go back into my research mm. database and find it in, in about 20 seconds instead of having to search through the entire net to try to find it again. So anytime in, when you're just surfing the web or whatever you're doing, if you find something you're interested in, you will then put it back and link it so that you can find it in Evernote? Yeah. It, so Evernote has a really wonderful little tool called the Web Clipper, mm-hmm. uh, which will save the full text of any article that you find. Uh, and it's nice. it's basically a key command away. So read it, find it, save it, and, and go back to it. Nice, later. nice. So, and I know you've personally seen some amazing results using your methods. You know, I'm curious of what you've learned that you still can't believe that you learned so fast. Um, I think it was programming for me. Mm. I mean, talk about a really big, hairy, kind of scary, frustrating yeah. sort of thing. You say the word and I get a little, I get it's, a little nervous. Actually. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and, and it's such a useful skill to have, but it's just, it's very difficult to get started. Yeah. And the, um, but once you pick up the, the fundamentals, you can do all sorts of, of different, very, very useful things. Um, so just being able, and, and, and more the skills of thinking through a, um, through a program or thinking about a program like or through a problem like a programmer. So being able to break mm-hmm. it down and imagine something as a process and this has to happen before that and what are the inputs that we need and what are the outputs that we need. Uh, that was a very, very useful and interesting skill. Um, the frustrating part about it was um, I, I like to talk about programming as like you're building, you're building something out of a set of Legos. So there are parts that you can put together in all sorts of you know, billions of possible combinations that right. all look different when at the end. But the difference between Legos and programming is if your program doesn't work, it's like your Lego uh, building exploding. Like it just, <laughs> you know, you try to run it and it doesn't right. run. And you don't know why and you have scratch. to put it together. It's uh, It can be very, very frustrating to get yeah. started. But once you know how it works, you can do all sorts of really useful things with it. Yeah. What about one that you're proud of from a physical standpoint? I think the the one that I'm, I'm proudest of there, um, so for the book, I learned, I, I um, live close to a lake. And so I learned how to windsurf hmm. for the book. Uh, that was really difficult. Was it? Uh, oh yeah, really. Um, I swallowed so much water <laughs> at, the, at the beginning. And you know, it's one of those things like if you imagine um, the the balance type of skill that you have to have, like yeah. for something like uh, skateboarding, it's very much the same with windsurfing. But if you lose your balance, you fall in the water and you have to climb back up and, and get started again. Um, so that was uh, a really interesting, challenging physical skill. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that I'm working on now, uh, similarly in the water, um, I have a rowing skull that I'm, I'm learning how to use a sliding seat rowboat, the really thin ones with the super long oars. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's fascinating, uh, because you have, there, there are, depending on how you count 10 to 20 different movements that all have to happen at the same time in the same way. And that has to be balanced or you tip the boat. Really? Uh, you tip or, the boat in that situation. Oh yeah, totally. Um, I or, know you know, let's, yeah, like, uh, an easy thing, like when you're pulling back on the oars, if one oar is a little bit deeper than the other, or it's at the wrong angle, or you pull on one harder than the other one, right. it'll actually wobble the boat to that side. And so getting all of those things working together, uh, super challenging physical skill. Yeah. That would motivate me if I get, if I would be thrown overboard, I would motivate mm-hmm. me to, to learn for sure. Yeah. Um, what about the, so break down the windsurfing a little bit. What were some of the methods you use? Cause you know, that's, it requires, Bail, it requires a lot of different things, you know, to do that. Yeah, totally. So um, the the first thing, and it, it seems kind of obvious in retrospect, but you have to learn how to put the board together. So there there are uh, five or six major pieces. So the sail, the mast, how it attaches to the board. There's a fin underneath the board and at the back of the board that you have to learn how to install and configure correctly. Hmm. And if you don't do that, you're going to have a really difficult time windsurfing. So 
even some of the things that you wouldn't think of, like setup, become really, really yeah. important. And that applies to anything, you know, the ukulele and all those other things, the setup. Okay. Absolutely. So you have to have the tools, you have to have the tools set up in the right way. Um, but then even something as basic as learning how to balance on a moving board. I, mean, I, I had never done that before. So a lot of the early hours of practice looked really boring. I would just take the board out into the water hmm. and I would practice standing on the board and moving back and forth and balancing and rocking the board to see how far I can lean in any direction before I fall over. Yeah. And it doesn't look like much when you're in the process of doing it, uh, but it helps so, so much when you actually have a sail attached to the board and, and the wind is blowing you and you have to know the limits of, of what your balance are. Yeah. So for someone who's not patient like you, who wants the quickest way to learn the, let's say they're, they're trying to windsurf, what would you get, what advice would you give on what portion to focus the most time and energy on from your experience? Yeah. So the basic idea with all of this is you want to do just enough research at the beginning to figure out what the most important parts of the skill are. Yeah. So call that deconstructing the skill. Yeah. Um, you don't want to research too much because uh, research can become a subtle form of procrastination. Yes. It's easy to keep reading. You have to actually get into the doing of the thing. Right. Um, so when you do that research and you figure out what the most important subskills are, the, the easiest and fastest way to level up in that skill is to just practice those most important subskills first because that's yeah. going to give you the biggest bang for the buck. Right. Um, and so it's it's really... That can be terribly frustrating because a lot of times the most important sub skills aren't the most exciting or, or the sexiest part of the process. Yeah. But yeah. those are the fundamental things that you're going to use to do to have all of these really cool, impressive results down the road. Yeah. yeah. So what was that for the ukulele? What was that fundamental thing that you just was maybe boring, but it produced the most results for you? Oh my gosh. So Music is, is inter so stringed instruments and, and um, so things like ukulele and guitar. Um, when you look at what it takes to actually play a song, there are only a handful of chords that are mm -hmm. used the vast majority of the time. So you learn, you know, seven or eight chords and, and you can play most of the, the songs that you would want to play. The tricky part is both, so learning the chord, where your fingers have to go, where to press down. Um, and you have to practice switching between the chords very quickly because yeah. you don't have much time to, to go from a C to an F to a G. And so it, it looks incredibly boring. And, and it's actually a, l a little bit more interesting when you're actually doing it. But just sitting there and strumming and practicing changing from one chord to the next um, is an, a, a very important thing to do early on. Yeah. Not exciting, but when you learn how to do that, all of a sudden you can play hundreds upon hundreds of songs. You just have to go through the process of training your muscles mm. to move in that particular way. Yeah. And Josh, with that, how did you figure out that was going to be the key component that you just needed to practice over and over? Yeah. So it was a combination of deciding what I wanted to do, which was I wanted to learn how to play popular songs and I wanted to learn how to play and sing at the same time. Yeah. So if that was success... Um, I researched, I, I picked up a couple of beginner ukulele books, which all talked about the importance of learning how to play chords and switching between the chords and strumming patterns and, and all of those very basic things. Yeah. And then I looked at some of the songs that I wanted to learn how to play. Yeah. And it, it doesn't take very much to, to realize that, hey, it's the same chords popping up over and over and over again. Mm, you're looking for and, the patterns. And so you look at enough so songs and you can really see that you, that there's a core set of things you need to know and it's really not that complicated. Yeah, yeah. So what were some other patterns? So for that, you saw the different specific chords popping up over and over. What were some other patterns that you saw with the skills that you were uh, learning? Yeah, so um, ukulele in, in particular, th there are some skills that... Um, build on others. So you learn how to do the chords. That's really cool. So mm -hmm. you strum all the strings at the same time. You make a pretty sound. Awesome. But what, if you want to play something more complicated than that, there's another skill that you can layer on top of that, which is called finger picking. And so instead of hitting all of the strings at the same time to play mm -hmm. the chord, you're just playing individual strings in a pattern. And it sounds really awesome and really fancy and really it hard. Does, yeah. And it's really not. Yeah. It's really, it's just layering one very basic 
way to level up playing a chord, and you can do all sorts of really interesting things with that. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Uh, so you, you can kind of think of um, skills are like ladders, so you always have to start at the bottom rung, right? Uh, everybody starts there, you learn the essentials, you move up a rung, and, and there's always going to be that one tiny step that will take you further that you can do way more with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what else do you tend to work on one thing at a time? Like right now you said you're working on rowing. Do you go, okay, I'm just going to choose one right now. Or do you have multiple going at the same time? Yeah, that's the ideal. Yeah. Um, and that's really hard to do, particularly if you want to learn how to do all sorts of super interesting things at the same time. Right. Um, it's really just a math problem, right? Like if you need a certain amount of time to get good at right. something, um, <laughs> You, you can either compress that time and learn something very quickly or you can spread it out over years and not make progress very quickly. Right. Um, so, and I found particularly uh, now that I have kids. So I have uh, a four-year-old daughter and, and an almost two-year-old son. Yeah. And that takes a lot of time out of the yeah. day too. We have very and similar so, age kids. That's why I'm smiling because when you say it's a mathematical equation, I'm thinking, all right, you got to add those two kids in there and all the time with that and yeah. work stuff and what's left. Yeah, so what I try to do is is anywhere between, and it depends on the skill, but if you can set aside 20 to 45 minutes-ish mm -hmm. around the time you go to bed, because there's, there's a, a lesser known fact that if you want to uh, level up very quickly in motor skills, um, it's useful to practice right before you go to bed. Mm. Because um, there's, there's a process that, that happens in your brain called consolidation, where when you're learning movement patterns, your brain has to encode how to move and, and what muscles to trigger when. Mm -hmm. And that happens when you sleep. And so if, if you practice a physical skill right before you go to bed or within, call it three to four hours yeah. of when you go to bed, that makes everything way more efficient. I love that. Because then you could just plan when you practice right before bed. That's a good one. And yep. I know you do a lot of research in general too. So what other cool research have you seen out there that – um, maybe it's in the book or maybe that you, you kind of use for yourself. Yeah. So I think, um, the, the practicing before you go to bed is a really good trick that, that I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the most important research thing that underpins this whole idea yeah. of, of rapid skill acquisition is when you look at studies of learning something new from scratch, mm -hmm. they all say the same thing which is the vast majority of, of progress in the skill happens in a very, very short period mm, of time. Really? And so, you know, performance at the very beginning is super terrible. Like everybody is terrible at the beginning. There's no getting around that. Uh, but when you look at the curves for all sorts of, of different types of skill, um, so physical skills, mental skills, skills for work, skills for fun, they all follow the same pattern. The early hours of research from a productivity standpoint in terms of how much you improve per unit of time, mm -hmm. it's all front loaded. So mm -hmm. the biggest um, the biggest challenge with that is the early hours of the skill are also the most frustrating. And yeah. so most people are not going to make it past those early, call it two to three hours, yeah. because it's so terribly frustrating to be terrible and to know that you're terrible and yeah. to choose to continue uh, Anyway, so how do you tell people to get over that? Because that's got to be a huge factor. You know, a kid who's trying to walk doesn't like, oh, I'm just going to stop trying to walk. I, you know, they just don't know any better and they just keep trying. Yeah, totally. Like, you know, it, it's funny. My my son is is learning to uh, to or has been learning to walk over over the past couple months. And it's like when a child falls, they don't say, man. I'm really not talented at walking. I should really go do something else that is a better use of like no, they just True, get back up yeah. and, and do it again. Um, the reason that the book is called the first twenty hours is I found that the first twenty ish hours are the the period where you make the most progress. Hmm. And if you pre-commit, so before you you start practicing at all or researching at all, if you say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to practice this for twenty hours. And if I'm terrible, I'm going to be terrible for 20 hours and that's okay. Right. But I'm going to finish that period of practice before I decide what to do next. Mm -hmm. 
That pre-commitment is one of the most effective things that you can do to make sure that you actually follow through with practicing the thing that you want to practice. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you do anything, because that is an important point, that pre-commitment, do you do anything else to hold yourself accountable or have someone hold you accountable with that pre-commitment? What do you suggest people do with that pre-commitment? Yeah, I actually don't. Um, so for me, that's enough to, to be like, okay, and I'm going to, I'm going to set aside the time. Yeah. It's going to be anywhere between 20 and 45 minutes a day. Um, the useful thing about that is if you're not willing to do that, it's actually a really good, uh, indication that this is not a priority for you mm -hmm. at this point in time. Yeah. And if it's not a priority, there's, there's really nothing wrong with that. Um, a lot of people feel bad about all the things that they're not learning. Um, when really you can just take an honest assessment of your schedule. Can you, can you spend 20 to 45 minutes a day for the next month or so? If so, great, do that. Um, I know a lot of people, and, and this is the, the more competitive types of folks, um, they like to add either some element of competition or, or some drawback or thing that they're going to lose or mm -hmm. um, some type of social pressure on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, that can work, I don't know if that's a great habit mm -hmm. to get into. You think it could backfire or? It can because, you know, there's there's a lot of research about um, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Mm. And the the most effective and most sustainable strategies are always come from that intrinsic motivation. You're learning something because either it's something that you're really into and you want to learn it or because it's there's some utility to you. There's some payoff or there's some benefit of learning. And if you can focus on that, like what are you going to get out of this thing that you're trying to learn? Um, I think that's probably the most sustainable strategy long term. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people read the book, the first 20 hours, what is the feedback you get from either people you've coached or who read the book? What do they struggle with most? A lot of people struggle with uh, what we talked about, the guilt of oh my gosh, I, I feel like there's something that I need to learn and I, I, I don't know if I'm really into it or I don't know mm. if, um, I don't know if I could do all of these things because I'm not really that interested in the thing. I just kind of feel like I have to. And that's that's a tricky place for, for mm. people to be. Um, we usually hear, hear from uh, people who need to learn things for school. Um, that's very, very common. Like, I have to learn organic chemistry stuff but I don't want to, but I kind of have I gotcha. to. Um, so in, you know, first 20 hours as a method isn't really optimized for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Highly recommend, you know, looking to, to folks like uh, Scott Young and Cal Newport who go crazy on study skills and, and, and they're yeah. super awesome uh, about that. Um, there are a lot of people who feel guilty about not having time or not making something a, a huge priority. Yeah. And, you know, the, the kids is a, a, a huge example. Like, yeah. Oh my gosh, I work a full-time job and I just had an infant. Like, how can I, like, I feel bad. I don't know if I have time. You're like, I'm not even sleeping. What, where do you want me to do with this? Yeah, like, and, and the answer is, it's okay to not make this a priority. Like, uh -huh. it really is. Yeah. But uh, when it's not a priority, let it not be a priority and don't feel guilty about mm. it. But when it is a priority, really make it a priority and, and use the time that you have set aside as effectively as you possibly can. Yeah. And this may sound like a simplistic question, but it's something I'm always thinking about is how do you make time? You know, because you're busy, you have two kids, you have mm -hmm. tons of stuff going on. How do you personally carve out that time for yourself? Yeah. The, uh, I think probably the easiest way to think about it is, um, a lot of, a lot of people say, oh, I need to find time. Um, you'll never find time because nobody's making more of it. Right. It's, it's not like you're going to you know, find an extra eight hours of time that you left in a coat pocket somewhere. Right. Uh, you always have to make it. And, and so the, the easy answer to, to that question is you have to consciously choose to not do other things. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, a lot of, a lot of folks watch TV. A lot of folks, yeah. um, will go out. A lot of folks, you know, will will do other, other things that, that mm. are useful cutting things out. Yeah. You just have to figure out, okay, if, if, if learning this thing is a big priority, Where's that time and energy going to come from? Yeah. And you just make that choice consciously. So how, what did you choose not to do because you're doing the rowing? Yeah. So um, rowing goes into exercise time. So a lot of the other exercise that I would otherwise do mm. just gets devoted to rowing. Got it. And it's nice that there's, there's a skill component there too. Right. You'll find with most, um, 
most methods of, of exercise, at least the really good ones, there's a skill component. So it, it pays to get good at all of the, uh, the things you want to do. Yeah. And Josh, one of the other things you mention in the research and when you talk is the Carol Dweck research, mm -hmm. fix versus growth. Can you talk about that a little bit and how that kind of fits into the book? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Dweck is a, a psychologist at Stanford and, and has done an enormous amount of research on the mindset that helps people learn. And a lot of her, her research is, is based on studying elementary school to students. So they would, she would take a class and split it in half and tell one, uh, one half of the students that your math skills, for example, are fixed, innate, talent-based. You're either good at it or you're not. Um, and we're going to give you an assessment to figure out how good at it you are. Um, she'll tell the other half of the students, you know, your mind is like a muscle. The more you you use it, the more you'll grow and the stronger you'll become. Right. And, you know, if you keep trying and keep building and keep practicing, you'll get better at this. Yeah. And so they'll do that over a period of time and then they'll measure math scores pre and post to mm. see how, how folks did. And the the people who are taught to believe that the more we practice and and the, the better we are yeah. um, at practicing the more you grow and the yeah. more you develop. And so I, it was kind of, you know, talking about the toddler earlier, like what if, what if we told kids that you're either good at walking or you're not, and if you're not, you shouldn't bother. Like, right. it's, it's, it sounds silly ridiculous. when you say it, but it's, it's what we tell ourselves. Yeah. But it's exactly what we tell ourselves. Yeah. I want you to talk about that because I think it's so important. It's some people I could see, you know, reading the title or the book and just thinking, you know, I'm just not good at this or is, I don't have a knack for this. And so I like when you talk about the fix versus the growth uh, mindset with that. Um, and, and so also, you know, obviously we're talking about quick wins and accelerated learning. What's something that you find comes up over and over? Because everyone's impatient. They want the greatest immediate impact to start learning quickly. What comes over and over with questions uh, from people when they want that immediate impact? And what do you tell them to start learning as fast as, as humanly possible? Yeah, I think um, going back to the ladder analogy that we talked about earlier, there are a whole bunch of people who want to skip rungs on the ladder. Mm. Like, you know, the, the whole like, if I can't instantly teleport myself to the top of this ladder, then I should absolutely not try in the first place. Or, you know, I would like to skip to rung 10 because that seems really efficient. Um, but that really ignores, like, if anybody who played any sport growing up has, has heard this over and over and over, it's all about the fundamentals. Yeah. And the fundamentals are incredibly basic. It's not what we like to hear. It's very boring at the beginning. It's like, this is not getting me what I want. But you spend a little bit of time there and you get good at that. And you become much better faster than you otherwise would be because the things that you're doing most of the time you've spent some time getting good at that first mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah people trying to to skip up the skill ladder a little bit faster than than is uh probably prudent um i see a lot of people not wanting to do research so not taking the time and you don't have to take in a tremendous amount of time so call it an hour or two go to the library, pick up a couple books, pick up a couple DVDs, spend some time learning from other people who have developed skills before you, yeah. and pay attention and, and see how they learn, what they focus on, what they emphasize, and what they don't. Yeah. Uh, because those are the things that are going to tell you what you should focus those early hours on. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Josh, when you say the steps of the ladder, how do those steps break down? Like, first you tell them they start with research. Mm -hmm. Or even before that, what's a priority and what they want to learn? And then what's what would you say are the next rungs? Like, let's say you sit down and you go, okay, I'm going to learn rowing. What yep. What's your methodology? Yeah, so uh, a couple things. Uh, and we've already talked about the first two. So you decide exactly what you want uh, to be able to do. And really put that in concrete terms. So when you're done, what can you imagine yourself doing? Like, what are you physically doing? What is the outcome of that process? Yeah. Uh, the more specific you are about that, the better off you are. Because a lot of people will um, either be way too vague. So it's like, I want to I wanna learn how to play, play the guitar, for example. Or I want to learn how to speak French. 
well, there's nothing there for you to actually practice. It's this big neg- nebulous blob of right. who knows what. And so you want to define it enough to be useful, but you also don't want to overdefine it to like, I am the best French speaker on the face. <laughs> and that's right. way over optimizing. Yeah. So it's like pick a target and hit it as effectively as you can. Yeah. Um, the second part is the research. So the deconstructing, trying to find the most important subskills um, and, and learning those first. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you want to spend some time making sure that you're remo- what, removing what I call barriers to practice. So those are the distractions, the um, not having the right equipment, not having the right the setup, all of the things that can get in the way of you practicing when mm-hmm. you sit down to practice. Mm-hmm. You want to get rid of all of those or mm-hmm. as, as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and you want to really make, you know, as we were talking about earlier, make that pre-commitment. Like when are you, so get out your schedule. When are you going to set aside the time to learn this thing? What yeah. does that look like? How are you going to practice? Yeah, yeah. So what has been your favorite um, story that you've heard of someone using the first 20 hours book and doing some special skill? Oh, there are, there are some really, really good ones. Uh, you can actually look on, on YouTube. There are folks who have learned to play things like the cello and the violin, not having to do it or not having done it before. Um, they've done it. They've, they've uploaded their results and they're, they're pretty darn good after 20 hours. Um, I, the, the thing that I like most about the book, um, because it really is like the method is very, very simple. Yeah. And it works for uh, mental skills, physical skills, work skills, um, hobbies. And it really is the, the, the very best thing that can come from the book, from, from my perspective, mm-hmm. is that it encourages somebody to pick up and try something that, that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Mm-hmm. So I, I heard from a friend uh, who, was, who was discussing this with, with a much older friend. She was actually 80 years old mm-hmm. and, and had always wanted to learn how to play the piano. Mm. And she's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Um, there was a guy who wanted to learn how to sumo wrestle. And I haven't, <laughs> I haven't received an update on that recently, but that's like, if, if the purpose, if the book helps somebody learn how to sumo wrestle, then awesome. <laughs> that's funny. I just picture myself in a sumo wrestling suit. Um, what about work skills? Um, you know, we talk a lot about hobbies. What have people done as far as work skills that you've heard? Yeah. So I've I've heard all sorts of things from from the the very complex like programming would be an example of yeah. like learn how to program and and if you're looking for a job you will probably not be looking for very much longer mm-hmm. um, to even some of the basic things like you know you can open up Microsoft Excel and learn how to use a spreadsheet mm-hmm. or a pivot table and you know for somebody who's never done that before or has always been kind of scared about how computers work and and a little intimidated by some of the more advanced stuff. It really doesn't take very much uh, to to be able to pick up something new that you can use in your job. Um, so speaking and writing skills are another thing that if you level up in speaking or level up in writing just a little bit, yeah, just you get such enormous benefits from it. Yeah. yeah. So what has been your favorite story from the book? For me or from other folks? From you. From you're, me? Yeah. When you're going yeah. through and you're like. This is this is good. This is gonna be in there. Or maybe your wife just like Josh. If you don't include this story, you're gonna be sleeping on the couch for the next month. I, I can I can tell you something that drives her crazy. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so one of the things that I, I learned in the the process of writing the book was I wanted to have an example of relearning how to do something you already know how to do in a more efficient way. Mm, yeah. And for me, that was touch typing. So everybody has the the standard QWERTY keyboard. Uh, it's not very efficient, and I spend a lot of time on the computer. So, so a little bit more keyboard efficiency. I love this. Yeah, awesome. Yes, okay. Yes. The most frustrating thing that I have ever done my entire life, like seriously, really? because I spent oh I spend a lot of time on the computer, right. and then I switch this keyboard layout to to a newer layout called Colmac, and all it, it like. It's a little bit dramatic, but if you get like a whole new keyboard or what do you whole new keyboard? Yeah. Well, actually what I did was I rearranged the keys on my existing keyboard. Really? Yeah. yeah. I like took a screwdriver and I literally popped them off and rearranged them <laughs> and then set it to, you know, my computer to use this new layout. 
but like, I couldn't use like I went cold turkey. I could not use QWERTY as a layout anymore. And for a good like at minimum three days, like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything on my computer. Couldn't surf the web. Could not type an email. Just because like, it was so weird the way it was configured. So weird. Like and, and and terribly frustrating because something that used to be instantaneous and effortless all of a sudden became super super difficult and frustrating. Yeah. Um. And I was able to train myself to regain my old typing speed within the twenty hour. Really. When, yeah. Um. Doing some of the things like you know practicing before bed and and breaking it down and and, and practicing in a, in a specific way. But now when Kelsey tries to use my keyboard. She can't because it's a new one. It's, <laughs> it's a good incentive for other people not to use my computer. So how much more efficient does it make you? Because I could see initially go, okay, this is not even worth the trouble. What did you read in your research? Obviously, you did a lot of research as you always do. What did you see that like, okay, this is going to be worth that 20 or 30 or 40 hours? It's way more efficient. So, so there's a, a very detailed study that, that I point to in the book. Um, it's about twice as efficient in really? terms of Holy yeah the, the amount of finger movement and, and muscular tension in your fingers that it takes to type something. Um, it is, uh, the, the way I like to describe it is QWERTY feels like when you're typing, your fingers are kind of flying all over the keyboard. Uh, typing with Colmac, it feels like you're just twiddling your fingers and words are appearing on the screen mm. because you spend the vast majority of your time without having to move very much. So, so what hour, Josh, do you think you had the biggest, like biggest turning point breakthrough with the, with the typing? Oh, that was probably our, I would call it eight of yeah. deliberate practice. That was about, about the time where I'm like, okay, I'm pretty slow, but I know where all of the letters You're are. You're not hopeless. And yeah, it was like, it may take me 10 minutes to type an email, but I can type an email. Um, and, and that's pretty typical. It's usually between the five and eight hour mark, depending on how complex the skill is is where you'll start to notice like, hey, this what what was once really difficult doesn't feel like such a big deal anymore. Yeah. And when you look back at that eight hours, you again, it's a learning curve too. Mm -hmm. What did you see? It was like, okay, I wasted a ton of time doing this. I should have just been doing this all along. Was there some type of skill or one, one of those methods that you, you should have been doing from the beginning? Yeah, so there's, um, there's an idea. This is actually an idea from linguistics in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you study words in a language, uh, what you'll find is there are combinations. So just like in in uh, music, where the same chords are used over and over again, yeah. uh, the equivalent of chords in languages are are called bigrams and trigrams. So th, for example, uh, is is a letter combination that appears over and over and over again. And so towards the end, and this was probably hours fourteen through twenty, mm -hmm. um, I decided to deliberately practice bigrams and trigrams. So I found a list of all of the mm. most common bigrams and trigrams, and I used a special typing trainer to practice those combinations. Aye. And I improved so, so quickly after that. Um, I actually wonder why m more typing trainers don't use that as a primary method because it's really effective. How'd you even figure that out? I mean, probably there's people who... who Research. <laughs> yeah. Just, just through just seeing patterns. I mean, I mean, did multiple people mention it? Like, was yeah, it an obscure it was, thing, or, or were you bound to come across it? No, I actually I found it. Um, so there's there's a uh, very smart gentleman. His name is uh, Peter Novak. Um, he is a, a programmer and and now works uh, at Google in a very high level. I think he's the director of machine learning or something. Um, so. I found him because uh, in in the process of writing a book, he published a list of the 10,000 most common words in English, hmm. which I was looking for specifically because if I was going to learn or train myself in typing words, I wanted to train myself on the most common words that I would use most often because that would help me improve faster. Right. So I found his list of uh, the, the 10,000 most common words in English. Uh, and then he had another article on his site, which was uh, doing the same for bigrams and trigrams. Like, mm. that is that is it's exactly what I'm pretty looking random. for. Should, should totally do that. It seems random. So at what point in the method do you tell people, listen, get a coach, get a mentor? Because at this point, it seems, you know, if they could do it on their own, that's great. Where should they interject 
and put someone who's already done it before? Yeah, uh, two answers to that question. So the first is my preference is to go through at least 20 hours on your own mm -hmm. before you get to get a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for that is simple. If you're going to make the most effective use of the coach's time, it's in your best interest to learn the basics first so you don't have to spend all of that time. You, could, you can kind of go to a, right. a more advanced skill level with the coach quicker. The exception to that is if there's a major safety concern. Yes. <laughs> and so for like skydiving, I would highly, highly recommend finding an experienced person to work with from the beginning. Right. Uh, but if it's reasonably That's safe... That's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> you if you're going to drown first. or fly out of a plane or fall to your death, yeah. then you should get a coach. If, if death or permanent serious injury <laughs> is, is a factor, you should, you should work with a coach. Yeah. So if you were to rewrite the book now, Josh, again, you probably learned after you wrote it, what would you include now in the, in the new edition? Yeah, so I, I learned a, a bunch of things um, in feedback from the book about yeah. additional barriers or, or things that people get really hung up about. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I underestimated was just how self-conscious adult learners are. Mm -hmm. um, we don't like to feel stupid. We don't like to feel like we're going to look bad in front of other people. And as a result, uh, the early hours of practice where you're terrible and you know you're terrible, and if anybody watches you practice, they're going to see you be horrible and they might think less of you or you know, all of those um, very adult neuroses are huge barriers. Yeah. And so one of the, the things that comes out of that is, is to know that up front right? You're going to be self-conscious. You, you're going to think you're terrible. This, this is a normal and expected part of the process. Yeah. And so learning to turn off the competitive and social signaling parts of our mind that really want to look good in front of other people. Yeah. And, and in my experience, all it takes is really just acknowledging that that is a thing and deciding that that's not a big deal right now. Yeah. And maybe practicing by yourself where nobody's going to see or hear you you know, mess up a bunch of times. Yeah. Um, it's such a, an almost universal thing for yeah. people. And so, you know, yeah, if, if you know that it, that is probably going to be a factor, you, you can do things to mitigate that in advance and that helps a lot. Yeah. Do you find, again, because you practice this over and over with the different skills, so I'm sure it gets easier and easier. It's like a muscle that you're, you're working, but I could see people, it's hard to get over that mental component. I, I could even yeah. see high-performance athletes who do it every day get into a rut or a slump with whatever sport, if it's basketball, shooting, baseball, hitting. What's worked for you the best to, in your mindset to get over like a mental barrier? You know, yeah. I, I'm I'm thinking about all of the things that I've learned. Yeah, it gets easier to apply the method, so because you know kind of what you're supposed to do and and look for whatever. Um, the mental part is is almost never the problem. Mm. Uh, the problem is emotional. Like I don't know if it emotionally gets easier to decide to learn something new and actually go through the process of doing that again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like every, every time you step up and try to learn something new, it, it's going to be frustrating. It's going to be intimidating. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things that you can be a little bit more comfortable, uh, but, but it's never going to truly go away and that's okay because it doesn't have to go away because it yeah. only lasts for a couple hours. So you're right. just going to bust through that and you're golden. So Josh, what other shortcuts for learning have we not mentioned so far that would be important for people to think about? Hmm. I think, um, can edit out the long pause. No, it's fine. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm just it's, looking uh, at, you know, are there any things shortcuts within the rungs of the ladder that would be important to note? Like within the research, there's shortcuts within the research or with, you know, within the deconstructing, there's shortcuts within deconstructing. Yeah, I think um, one thing that might help is plan your practice sessions around one specific subskill. Mm -hmm. So we'll use ukulele as an example. Yeah. Like I'm going to pick up the ukulele. I'm going to spend 20 minutes 
practicing chord changes and that's all i'm going to practice i'm not going to practice songs i'm not going to practice finger picking i'm not going to do any of that it's this amount of time devoted to this specific sub skill mm-hmm. um and it it goes back to the math problem thing that we were we were talking about earlier like you have to spend a certain amount of time getting experience with this these fundamental things yeah and so if you can do that your practice sessions become way more efficient yeah I want to know from you who's been an influential mentor for you and what they've taught you because it seems like you just have this, I don't know if it's an innate ability to deconstruct and do these things or who are your, who've been your mentors? You know, I don't know on the deconstructing part if, if I've had a mentor, mm-hmm. probably the, the, the thing that I would say is I, I read a lot mm-hmm. in a very wide variety of areas. Yeah. And so so all of the people who have written good and useful books over the years um to to a greater or lesser extent become mentors, right? Because right. you know, particularly, you know, not not so much the reading fiction or or the more narrative forms of of nonfiction, but the people who write books that are designed to teach somebody how to do something. Um, you read enough of those books over a period of time and, and you see patterns in what what is emphasized first and how you break it down and what you focus on. Um, so y- you can learn how to do the deconstruction part um, from hundreds of different people. Um, there's there's a, a guy, I'm actually uh, also in the process of, of learning a, a martial art mm. right now. Um, so I won't mess uh, with you. Le- well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not yet. Um, but a, a lesser one known uh, called uh, Bagua Zong. And there's a, uh, there's a wonder, wonderful, wonderful book uh, by a teacher in, in California, uh, Ted Mancuso, where you can see like this very specific, crazy, you know, lesser known skill. He breaks it down in a way that's really, really good and valuable. And you can do the same thing to pretty much anything. Yeah. So, yeah, read how-to books about how to do things. It, <laughs> it, it really helps. So, you know, obviously you've taught a lot. There's a lot, I, you know, obviously suggest people get the, the first 20 hours fantastic book and watch your TED talk. What are some of the small action steps people should start doing right now if they are just, they're thinking about, they have that list, that bucket list, I want to learn Spanish or this or that. What are some of those small steps that they should do right now that will make the biggest difference for them? Yeah, the, the first one and, and by far the most important Choose one, uh, and only one. Yeah. As hard as that is, and and actually the the easiest thing that I've found for that is uh, take that bucket list of yours, and there's there's a a, a super useful way to narrow that down and, and to actually choose one. Mm-hmm. And uh, the method I use for that is is if you could only learn half of these things, what ha- half would you keep and which half would have to go? Mm-hmm. And you use that, cut the list in half, cut the list in half, cut the list in half over and over again until you get down to, to one or two. Right. And then pick that one. Because that's probably going to be the one that's going to give you the most bang for the buck. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so choose one thing to focus on right now and decide exactly what you want to be able to do when you're done. So don't keep it at the nebulous, I want to learn French level. Choose something very, very specific. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, it's way easier to do the research and do the deconstruction and go through the rest of the process. But it all starts with choosing to learn something yeah. new. Yeah. So what do you think your your ultimate superpower is? Like what do you, your, your wife or <laughs> friends say, you know, Josh, you are unbelievable at, I don't know if it's research or what is it? I think it's probably the the synthesis and the understanding of something. Mm-hmm. Um, for for whatever reason, um, one of the things I'm good at, and and one of the things that I really like doing, is taking a lot of of different pieces of information and kind of boiling that down into the essential. Yeah. You know, here's the important part, or this is what you should focus on. All yeah. of those things, um, and really the focus of my work. You know, first twenty hours is a good example of that. Like, let's take all of the psychology research about how to learn and like boil it down into one method that really works if you do it right. Um, but, but even my, my other work, like, um, the personal MBA is, you know, what are all of the possible things that somebody can learn about business? And here's the handful that are actually 
important that you should probably learn first. Right. Um, so yeah, big big trend in in my research in general, and and um, something that I think a lot of people find useful. Yeah, yeah. So I have one last question, Josh. Before I ask it, just tell people where should they find out more? Where can they check out your information, the book? Sure. So uh, my personal website, where you can find my latest research essays, all of the the latest greatest stuff, is joshkaufman.net. And if you're interested in learning more about the first twenty hours and all of the crazy experiments that I did in the process of research and writing that. Uh, that's first20hours.com. Yeah. I wanted to hear what you're working on now that you're excited. What's on the neck? What's on the horizon? Yeah. So uh, it's actually a combination of, of both the personal MBA and the first 20 hours okay. in, in a lot of ways. Um, I'm going to be writing about the process of starting a company from scratch. Okay. So by yourself, for yourself, no funding, uh, no outside advantages, just just you, the idea, and the people that you're trying to sell it to. Um, so it's it's fun because it's bringing in uh, here are the most important ideas in business that we talked about in personal MBA. Uh, if you're going to run a business by yourself, you're going to have a lot to learn. So all of the skill acquisition stuff that we talked about in the first 20 hours is very very relevant. Yeah. And um, running your own business is becoming a, a more uh, common, more important, and more valuable way to spend your career. And a lot of people who are either uh, who either want to be entrepreneurs, so working in a day job and hating their life and you know wanting to work for themselves, um, they want to learn how to do it. But there are a lot of people who are you know freelancers or consultants um, or people who have skills in certain areas, but they've never had business training. So they're kind of accidentally starting a business, but they don't exactly know what they're doing. Uh, the the next book is going to be addressing all of that. So mm. how do you go about starting a process, starting a business in a smart, sustainable way? Mm. See, my last question was gonna be, um, let's end with a song and sing Gangnam Style. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my ukulele right now. No, because I'm like I was admiring your voice on the video. So I'm like, and I especially like the Gangnam Style clip that you say in there. I thanks. Just it was hilarious. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, if uh, if anybody's interested, just I'll, go to I may clip it on the end of this. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to clip it on the end because I think it's amazing. So, But any parting words, Josh, that you could think of? Where should we leave people? Yeah, so I think when when you think about learning that thing that you've always wanted to learn how to do. So maybe it's something for fun. Maybe it's something to work for work. Who knows? Um, it probably feels big. It probably feels scary. You probably don't have any idea where to start. Um, so the good news is all of those things are surmountable. Yeah. Like you could sit down tonight and decide what you want to do and start the process. And in a couple days or a couple weeks, you could finally be able to do that thing that you want to be able to do. Um, I think skills are such, it's, it's a fundamental part of life, right? That's, that's, you know, how we make our living. Yeah. That's how we have fun. And so uh, take that thing you've always wanted to learn how to do and sit down and do it. There's, yeah. there's really nothing in your way. Yeah. Well, you provide the recipe, Josh. I appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. There was a, a wonderful band in Australia uh, called Axis of Awesome. They are a, a comedy rock band. And they have a, uh, a song that they call the Four Chord Song. And, and the gag is that you can play every pop song ever written uh, if you know four chords and you know how to switch between them. Just a small town girl living in a lonely world. She took a midnight train going anywhere. And Adele, I heard that you settled down, that you found a girl that you're married now every night in my dreams I see you I feel you that is how I know we'll go on I won't hesitate no more no more it cannot wait I'm yours cause you're amazing we did amazing things if I could and I would I'll go wherever you will and can you feel the love tonight she will be loved and she will be loved 
When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. Sometimes I feel like I don't have a partner. No woman, no cry. I'm up, but this surely is a dream. I come from a land down under. Once a jolly swag man camped by a billabong. Hey, I just met you, and this is crazy. But here's my number, so call me. Hey, sexy lady. Whoop, 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 whoop. Welcome Gangnam Style, time to say goodbye. Closing time. Every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 